So let's pray, if you'll bow your heads, and then I'll tell you some more. Father God, we praise you and we thank you for all the awesome things that you do and we praise you for who you are, Lord. Uh, Father, thank you for this opportunity that we can come together and learn more about your creation. Be glorified, Lord, in everything that we learn. Uh, be lifted up. And Father, I'd ask that you would help me to be a broken vessel that you can speak through, that you can shine through, that I would be edifying, encouraging, entertaining, and educational for these young people, Lord, so that they might be blessed and that, that uh, ultimately, Lord, Lord, that they might trust your word more, that they might draw closer to you, and that they might very strongly be the salt and the light that you've called them to be in your life and in their life, Lord. And so we, we praise you and we thank you. I'd ask that you would deal with any uh, issues that they have in their families. You know what they are, Lord. Please bless their families and help them with those things and the young people individually. And help me, Lord, to be clear so that they understand these things that we go over. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, that's why I normally won't pray because I pray long okay so normally I'm gonna ask one of y'all to pray okay so you people have been here before I already know that all right so you have how to do the, the lab write-up uh, please when you do the lab write-ups actually do it Roman numeral one purpose and I told you there that the purpose can usually be found uh, in the introduction of the lab. That is not always true, but in physical science, which he wrote later than the other courses, it is, praise the Lord. So it makes it easier. Um, and then the procedure is basically what you do as far as the steps in the lab. I want you to not do that in a paragraph form. Some people do that, and that drives me crazy. Uh, if you're a paragraph person, praise the Lord, but not here. In science, I want you to do it just as briefly as possible. One, two, three, four, five steps. Okay, keep them very brief and steps, boom, 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 so you can see them and it's very clear. And, and that would be your procedure portion. And then Roman numeral three would be your observations. Anytime you can draw a picture for your observations, picture's worth a thousand words, more power to you, just draw a picture. You know, that works for me. Um, you can use colored pencils if you don't want to say, it turned blue, just paint it blue, you know, with your colored pencils. I'm good with that. So, but you do need to write down your observations in that section. And then your conclusion, and this is where most people have problem because most people on their conclusion they want to go back and say the observations again that's not what that section's for your conclusion is to actually state the fact that you were trying to learn and then tie it together with your observations where can the fact that you were supposed to be learning be found usually in the purpose because that's why you were tortured with it in the first place. Yeah! Okay. Just so you got a little heads up on that one, okay? And I'll, I'll try to help you with that as much as I can as we go through. Um, I'm going to assume that this is your first high school level Jay Wiles course, maybe your first Apologia course. So I'm just going to go through everything with you guys to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, as you read through your book, follow your syllabus please each week. As you read through your book, you are responsible to do all of the on your own problems. Um, the answers to the on your own problems are actually in the back of each chapter. I remember some students didn't figure that out for quite a long time and when they heard that they went, oh! So I just want you to know they're there. Why? Are they there for you to cheat? No. Practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. And so if you're not learning it correctly, then you're learning it incorrectly. And so the answers are there to check yourself to make sure you're getting it right so that you can continue to go on. Does everybody understand that? So it's not there to cheat with, it's there to benefit you <clears throat> so that we can make sure that you're learning it correctly. Um, and then at the end of each chapter is a study guide. The test questions will be taken from whatever's covered on the study guide. And so that's a huge praise the Lord because you don't have to try to memorize the whole chapter. You just memorize the concepts that are in the study guide and, and you should be covered. Um, <laughs> In his pedagogy, which none of you probably read, your parents probably did, but anyway, <laughs> which is at the very beginning of the book, he mentions that he wants you to memorize the definitions in his books. Some of you had me for middle school science, and you know I don't like memorization, except for the Bible and some poetry or something like that. So I'm telling you right now, do not memorize J. Wiles' words. He is not the scripture, okay? It's more important that you memorize concepts. You will remember concepts far longer than you will memorize this guy's words. The students I knew that 
just refused to do what I told them and memorize Jay Wiles' words, a month later I'd ask them what a definition was and they had no idea. Because they just memorized the words for the test and then it was gone. Well, that's not why we're doing this. We're doing this so that you learn concepts about God's creation to bring Him glory. And so the concepts are much more important, okay? So in class, I'll always try to give you little short definitions. You're welcome to come up with your own little short definitions. I'm happy with that. On your test, I accept little short definitions as long as you have three or four words there that give me some clue that you're on the right track. I'm good. Now this is why it's so important that we grade the tests together. <laughs> Because your moms might look at those definitions and go, that's not right. <laughs> and I'd look at it and go, yeah, that's perfect. That's just what you needed. So we will be grading the test together. And how this works is this. Each module in here, unless your syllabus says otherwise, there is one module we will do in one week because we're going to spend three weeks on astrophysics just because it's so much fun. <laughs> but anyway, um, so we're going to go really fast through one module. Uh, but otherwise, you're going to spend two weeks on each module. So this week, you'll do the first half just like the syllabus says. Next week, you'll do the second half of the module and you will complete the study guide to the best of your ability. And then you will come into class. Do not take the test next week, okay? You will come into class. We'll go over the second half of the module. We will go over the study guide together so that if you have questions on it, you don't have to panic. It's all good. We're gonna go over it together. And then after that class, you're going to go home, and your syllabus will say this, you're going to go home, you're going to study for and take that test, and I would seriously suggest you do that within a day or two of the class, because you don't want to try to remember that for days and days and days. That's just setting yourself up for failure, and I'm all about setting yourself up for success. Okay, so get it done, take the test, take a Sabbath, praise the Lord, worship a little, and then start on the next chapter with whatever the syllabus says. It's also important that you do the labs, make sure you've read all the labs you're, that are in the chapter. You have to read all the labs, whether we do them or not, but because he expects you to. And then any that I ask you to write up, write them up before you take your test because sometimes the questions will come from the labs. See, even though they're not on the syllabus, he figures they're fair game. Okay? <laughs> so make sure that if you're supposed to do a lab write up that you do that before you take your test. I'll try to always give you a heads up if I know something's coming on the test that might not be real obvious in the study guide. I've taught his stuff for over a decade now, scary, so I can do that. Um, and I'll try to be as fair with you as possible because I can't stand the fact that life's not fair. It's all part of the curse of death and sin and, you know. So I'll try to be as fair as I can, but, but you know, this is where you need to go with this. You need to try to make sure you keep all this in a notebook and keep it neatly. You can keep it by module if you want, or you can keep a separate lab book if you want. Uh, but your mom needs this for her portfolio and for your portfolio, but it's really mom's because she's homeschooling you. But anyway, um, so she needs this for your portfolio, so make sure that you keep it in there and try to keep it neatly. The third week when we get together, that week after the test, after we pray, the first thing we'll do is grade that test together. And so that way, now I know some of you are real overachievers uh, like I was, and you won't be able to stand waiting until class. And if that's the case, that's fine. You and your mom sit down and grade the test. You will still grade it in class. You may get more points with me than you do with mom. I'm just telling you that right now. Because your mom may look at it and go, what do you got there? And it might be exactly what I said in class. Okay, so, but if you yourself need to look at it and just can't stand it, which is what I was like, okay, I understand you go ahead and do it, but we will grade it together in class and then you're going to want to keep those uh, test scores and because you're going to use those for your mom to figure out your grade at the end of the class. Okay, any questions on that part so far? All right, so let's go ahead then and let's look at module one. If you don't have your book open, please open it to module one. I should mention one other thing. Um, there is going to be extra reading in here at times. You'll see it on the study guide and it'll say, uh, study guide, you'll see it on the syllabus and it'll say to you, you need to read this article or you need to read that. Um, those will be found on the website so that you can um, download those and print those out. It won't happen a lot, 
but on when we cover global warming, I want you to have the most accurate information that's up to date. When we uh, do the Ice Age, it's not covered in here, and we're going to cover the Ice Age. When we do the uh, astronomy, um, we're going to do creation astronomy, and we're going to have a blast with that. So there's a lot of very cool information that is not in your book, so we're going to supplement your book. Okay? So I just want to give you the heads up. Don't worry, I won't crush you with all the extra reading. There's not that much, but there are a few things that you're just, they're helpful. So we're going to add those in. And so your mom can find those on that website. All right. Physical science is the study of the physical universe around us. And as much as I'm more of a life science person, physical science is fun. And the reason physical science is fun is because it really deals with the stuff all around us all the time. Now, some of you people are not science people. You're dancers or you're you're artists or you're into other things and praise the Lord God created each of us for his glory to do different things but some of you are like me and you're science people and you just like to look at things around you and go well I wonder how that works <laughs> come on give it up how many of you ever look at things and go well, I wonder how that works okay there's a few of us and that's how I always was and so I enjoy physical science because it just explains so many normal things that are around us all the time and so we're going to be studying the planet, we're going to be studying the stars, we're going to be studying um, the other planets, all sorts of the physical world we'll be doing in this. So there is math involvement. You already noticed the math involvement, didn't you? Okay, and uh, so I'm going to help you guys with all of that. But as we do that, the first thing he wants us to learn about is atoms and molecules. And actually turn the page to page two, and let's look at the introduction together. Now hopefully you've already read this, but he tells us here that atoms are too small to see with the naked eye, way, way too small to see with the naked eye. And um, he tells us that in this experiment that we can distinguish between different kinds of atoms and different kinds of molecules by examining the substances they make up, as well as how those substances change. In this experiment, we will observe molecules breaking down while other molecules are built up. By observing these changes, you will learn about the differences between atoms and molecules. Each of you in front of you, I'm going to borrow yours. Solomon, right? Okay. Each of you have a, a cup of water which has baking soda in it. And instead of torturing you to do this, my husband was tortured. <laughs> and so he does these for me every year. Only well, usually he used to make you guys make them, and now he's just given up on that. He makes them himself. But anyway, he has made these. They're prepared for you. If you pull these off, you have the two wires. Now, you do not want to touch the two wires, and you boys don't do it just to see what happens, okay? Just don't. All right. Um, you girls either. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to try to bend these kind of like at a similar place because ultimately what you want to do is you're going to hang these two wires in the cup, and you're going to want to set this so it'll set down next to it on the table and that, that's still in the water. If you have a proper connection... If you have a proper connection, I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but there should be little bubbles on both wires. Go ahead and do that, and then we're going to talk. So don't get crazy. Just go ahead and do that. All right. All right, Becky's got one going, and so, do, okay. Carson. Okay. What do you see happening? You see bubbles, but there's something else happening. The, one of the wires is starting to turn a bluish color, or turquoise, us ladies might say. You notice the boys say either blue or green, and the ladies go, turquoise, teal. You know, it's just, okay. Same idea, though. Um, what about the water? Does anybody notice what's going on with the water? Maybe you... It's turning blue. It's turning blue, too. In a lot of cases, the water itself. And we're going to let this go for a few minutes. Now... While we're letting it go, let's talk about it just because of time. What's happening here is that we have two copper wires, and the copper wires are made up of one type of atom. The atom is copper. Exact. That was good. <laughs> that one was easy. Now, on, on page three, he defines atoms for us as the smallest chemical unit in matter. So you cannot get any smaller and still have one chemical unit. We can look at subatomic particles. You probably have studied before that atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. But those are not within chemistry. The smallest unit of chemistry would be the whole atom itself made up of its proton, neutron, and electrons. Okay? 
And so the wire there is made up of all sorts of copper atoms together to make up the wire that is macroscopic that you can see. And here he tells you that uh, there are 10 to the 19th atoms on the head of a pin. That's how small they are. They're very, very small. Um, so <laughs> now, when I was in high school chemistry, and my professor said he's torturing us with atoms and molecules, and then he said, uh, nobody's ever seen an atom. My hand immediately went up. I was not trying to be smart, and I said, then how do we know they exist? That's how I think, okay? I mean, you don't know, I'll tell you how many times I've called Jay Wiles as we go through the book, because I call him and go, how do you know this stuff? Okay, and I'm a science major, but a different kind of science than this, and I'm like, and that's how I think. And when I asked my professor, well, he wasn't my professor, he was a, the chemistry teacher, he had no idea. Because the poor guy was the coach, and they had nobody to teach chemistry, and they jammed the poor guy in there, and he looked at me, and he thought I was being nasty. He goes, oh, stop, and I, I really wanted to know. If you can't see atoms, how do you know? Now, see, I've been through a lot of school since then, and I can answer that question for my students. And he tells you right here, because Jay Wiles has a PhD in chemistry, <laughs> so he knows the answers to these questions. And the reason is that we have indirect evidence, that they can do experiments to tell us about the atoms, even though they're too small for us to see individually, which is quite cool. And you're actually doing an experiment to that extent right now, because what you've got is you've got these atoms in there, and they're because we've got power to them with the battery, they're interacting with the water molecules in the cup and the baking soda that's in the cup. There is baking soda in the cup also that I put in there previously. Um, so first, the next thing we have to do is we have to determine what's a molecule. So turn over to page four, please. And on the top of page four, he defines a molecule for us as two or more atoms linked together to make a substance with unique properties. I don't want you to memorize all that. So what's a molecule? Two or more atoms that are attached or linked, whichever you want to say. That's all you have to write for definition. But listen to me. Even though that's all you have to write for definition, you need to know that molecules have unique characteristic properties. What do I mean by that? Well. The molecule of oxygen that we breathe is made up of two oxygen atoms that are attached to one another. That's what that represents, is two atoms of oxygen that are attached to one another, actually with two bonds. That's why there's two little lines there. And this would be represented as O2. It's a molecule because it's made up of more than one atom. I know that because of the little number here. And so that's a molecule. As soon as you get more than one atom attached to each other, it's a molecule. See, that copper wire is just a whole bunch of copper that are attached to each other but not attached in a molecular form, okay? And so, and we'll do that in chemistry. I don't even want to go there. My point was that when we change uh, anything about a molecule, it's a new molecule with new characteristic properties. If I add only one more oxygen to this and make it O3 instead of O2, now it's ozone. This, we die without. This, you breathe it and you die. Wow. One little atom difference in a molecule, totally different properties. I got another one for you. How about this is a molecule of hydrogen gas. It would look like this. And if you combine it with a molecule of oxygen, you would make water, H2O and actually one of the oxygens would leave. This is an explosive gas. This is a combustible gas. This we put out the fires with and it's a liquid. Okay, do you see one little change and oh my goodness, it's like a totally different thing. I got another one that some of you guys particularly will be able to relate to. Iron is very strong, it's magnetic. If you put it in the presence of water and oxygen, it turns to iron oxide, which is rust, which you can put your finger through, so it's no longer strong, and it's no longer magnetic. Why? Because now it is a new molecule. Any change in the molecule makes a new molecule with new characteristic properties. So for a molecule, you need to just write two or more atoms linked or attached, however you want to say that, but you need to know 
that they have new characteristic properties depending on what you've done to change it. Now, does God have a Lego set or what? He's got 116 Legos, the atoms. And however he chooses to put those together, you add one different Lego and it's a totally different thing. It could go from being a solid to a liquid to a gas, totally different. Just, boy, what a Lego set, right? Serious stuff. Um, on page four on figure 1.1, he shows you the hydrogen and oxygen atoms. And then to the right-hand side, he shows you when they're linked together, they make water molecules. So there's your difference between atoms and molecules. Now, look at your, may I pick up yours, Solomon? Yeah. Thank you. Look at your experiment once again. I want everybody to notice how the water has turned blue. And then if we pull this out, you'll notice that one of your wires is actually turning um, a turquoise color or a bluish color. What color is the other end of the wire? Black. Well, it's, it's still that darker copper color, isn't it? It's like a dark brown, okay? What's happened here is this, and he explains this on page five. The electricity has broken the water molecules. It's allowed this reaction to occur. That's what the battery is doing, is producing the energy to break the water molecules. And the bubbles that you're seeing are actually hydrogen and oxygen where we're breaking down the water molecules into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Pretty cool, huh? Now on the side that turned turquoise, we've actually produced copper hydroxycarbonate. And that's on page five. That's the only reason I can say that, okay? <laughs> Copper hydroxycarbonate. And that is actually made from the baking soda reacting with the copper to give you, and the water, to give you that new molecule. And we're going to let these go for a while. You're going to find that eventually that one side will stop bubbling. Because when it has all interacted, it will no longer react at all because it'll all be a new molecule that no longer interacts in this uh, chemical reaction, which is pretty cool. He shows you a picture on page five of the Statue of Liberty, uh, and she's turquoise there, and a Civil War cannon, which is turquoise. Moms, isn't this called fill grease when people buy bronze things that are turquoised? There's a or big grease or something? Filgree? Maybe it's filgree. I think a lot of people buy stuff that is already um, bronze that looks this color because it's, it's supposed to look aged. I know personally, um, I was flying into New York City to speak in, I speak on creation science for those of you that don't know me. And um, when I was flying into New York City, I am a native Floridian. I had never been to New York City except for that time, never really been to New York City, just flying in to go to Maine and, and Connecticut to speak. And as I'm flying in, there's a New Yorker sitting on the window seat, and I want to see the Statue of Liberty. I mean, he sees her all the time. You know, I want to see the Statue of Liberty. And so I'm leaning over this guy to see the Statue of Liberty, and, you know, and he's like, <laughs> and then I see her, and she's green. And I went, oh, she's green. And my husband just dies, you know, because he's like, oh, gosh, shut up, will you? And the guy's looking at me like, what? You're a yokel. Where are you from? I didn't expect her to be green. I don't know why. I expected her to be metal colored. You know, but she's green, trust me. Um, and so this is why. Now, you've probably been places, maybe with your folks in the, um, that are older cities that have the city hall with the bronze top and now it looks turquoise and stuff like that. You've probably seen these or cannons that have turned these colors. Maybe you've been in old cemeteries where you've seen the bronze things that have turned these turquoise colors. And so that's that reaction. And um, so that's how we're going to write up this experiment. When you write this up, the purpose was, as you found in the introduction to learn about atoms and molecules and the differences and then what you learn there is that molecules have unique characteristic properties that are very different from the atoms that make them up and that was you know what you'd say you'd learn and then you'd say something like as seen by the one side stopped bubbling after it was done because it stopped interacting and the other you know and come up with it try to connect it in with the observations that you make um, okay let's see on the bottom of page five he mentions that if you have like our copper wire that's made up of all copper, 
that's called an element because it's something that's just made up of one type of atom. If you have distilled water where it's all made up of one type of molecule, and I say distilled water because if you're not talking about distilled water, there are other things in it. But distilled water is all just water. And so distilled water would be all one type of molecule, and he tells us that that is called a compound. So it elements all one type of atom. A compound is all one type of molecule. And the last one he tells us is when you have several different things mixed together, like most of our water, uh, it's called a mixture. And so he gives us those three words. So let's go over to page six. And on page six, let's read one, the On Your Own 1.1 together. And Becky, would you read that 1.1 um, for us, please, ma'am? A molecule is broken down into its constituent atoms. Do these atoms have the same properties as the molecule? What do you think? No, good girl. She says no. No, the atoms will have different properties than the molecule would have. Now, while I'm on this, I want to say something. The word there is constituent, and some of you probably know what that means. And some of you probably think, wow, I heard that when mom voted last. And some of you may have absolutely no idea what that word means. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up is this. On your test, you are not allowed to ask your mom for help on any vocabulary words. You're supposed to know those. But if there are any other words on your test that are just English words that you don't know what they mean, you need to go ask your mom or dad or you need to get a dictionary out and look it up. This is not a general English test. This is a physical science test. Okay? So it's very important that if you hit a word, because he does this sometime. I have this happen in biology. He'll use certain words that the kids will come in and go, I didn't know what that word meant, and it wasn't part of the biology class. It was just a general word. Do not miss a question because there was a word in the question that you didn't understand. Ask your folks. Get a dictionary. Not allowed to do that with vocabulary words, but please do do that with any other words so to make sure you understand what the question is asking you. Okay? And so th that just made me think of that, so we did that. Thank you. Um, Mariah, would you do 1.2 for us, please, ma'am? Just read it, please. When salt is dissolved in water, it actually breaks down into two different substances. Is salt composed of atoms or molecules? If you can break it down, what do you think? Is it atoms or molecules? Let's say maybe atoms. Okay. <laughs> it's actually molecules. Now, let me, let me just say this, and Mariah, thank you. What he's asking you is if, if water is made up of H2O and we can break it down into hydrogen and oxygen, we know that it originally was made up of more than one atom and therefore it was a molecule. Some of you are thinking, but wait a minute, molecules are made up of atoms, so ultimately everything's made up of atoms. I would have done that. That's overthinking the question. Don't overthink the question. And that might have been what you were doing. That's why you might have been having trouble. Because you know what, Mariah, I'm so there. I'd have been thinking, now, wait a second. Everything's made up of atoms. And so really, the, the answer would be atoms. You know, don't do that, OK? Uh, you'll get in a lot of trouble within your academic career doing that. So try to answer the question that he obviously is trying to put across. And don't overthink it. You'll figure out which teachers you have to overthink it with. And then you'll usually want to get out of their classes. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, so. The point is that if you can break it down, it's a molecule. If you can't break it down, figure it's an atom. That's going to be our rule of thumb in this class, OK? If you can break it down, it was a molecule. If you can't break it down, it's an atom. All right. Then he's got a picture down here of what nickel will look like if the a scanning electron microscope is actually, everything's actually correct. And he tells us here on page 7, that nobody's ever really seen atoms because there's some ifs involved. If the theory is correct of quantum mechanics, if the computer calculations are correct, then we're seeing a representation of nickel atoms. He says he thinks all these things are correct, but theories could always be wrong, and so nobody has ever really seen an atom. Now, a lot of schools would just tell you, yeah, we've seen atoms, there they are. But as Christians, we really want to be more careful than that. We want to be above reproach. We've really never seen individual atoms, but maybe this is what they look like. And so, very possibly, if these ifs are correct. Okay? Okay, then we get to units. And I'll tell you what. Let's just, we're going to look at this. I want you to look at this one more time. And you're probably going to notice now, if you're close to it, that 
Which side is still bubbling? The copper looking side or the turquoise side? The copper side will continue to bubble because it did not change into a new molecule. The turquoise side, when it turns turquoise, it stops bubbling because that's the new molecule that we've formed. 